Okay, so this is the uh, board camera, the, what is it, um, it's the PZ2040, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I'll put links in the first part of this video anyway, so you'll be able to see what it is. And this is the one I got from Savalzone, it's called the CC1333-B. And this is the PAL version, there's an NTSC version, if you want it. But to be honest, these days when we don't have analog televisions anymore, there's really no reason to stick with NTSC if you are in America, because PAL gives you higher resolution. It really does. There's more vertical lines of resolution with a PAL system than with an NTSC. So you might want to consider, you know, maybe just get a PAL camera one day and just see if you can notice the difference. But I'll open up, oh no, oh my God, it's an unboxing. So, sorry about that, folks. But, um, so what you basically get in your package, get the board camera, and of course get it with a 2.8 millimeter lens because you want wide angle with FPV, otherwise you won't be able to see where you're going. Your peripheral vision is quite important so you can see what's out to the side when you're turning sharply and so forth. Really you can fly with a 3.6 millimeter lens if you want, but honestly a 2.8 is probably the best. It's what most people use. now. What we're going to have to do here with this board camera is remove this little edge around the side. See, it's already sort of routed. They've routed along the sides here. So the only bits that are holding the thing on are the little corner pieces. So all we're going to do really, there's one of two ways we can do that. And I have to get me other granny glasses to do this because I'm half blind. It's trouble with you get old, you lose, lose half your vision. But there we go. So you can use your side cutters. Better move into shot. Use your side cutters just to nip away that little piece there and a little piece like so. I'll just chip that away there so I can get a proper cut on it. And this is quite brittle this board so it does snap quite easily and then so if you go around like so, just chopping out the bit then you can get in there. So go around one way to start with. I'm hoping this is going to come through on the camera all right. Here we go, last bit here. And then we go around the other way. So just turn it, flip it over. And now you can go around the other way and take out the other piece that we didn't get the first time. So, and then the bit flies off there, you see? Like so. And like so. And like so. It seems pretty brutish, doesn't it? But if you're using decent side cutters, that piece will come off pretty easy. And then what I recommend is that you get a file and just file down, because you see there's some, some sort of poking out edges there because when you cut it off with the side cutters it doesn't necessarily make it totally clean so get um, a file and just dress up the sides here to get rid of these little nasty remnants. Right as you can see I've just tidied up those edges and it's looking really spick and span now no problems at all. So next thing we have to do is get our spacers and our little camera mounting plate. So here's the plate it's made of fiberglass in this case it's carbon I think in the carbon version of this little thing and the spacers these are the little two millimeter standoffs that I was talking about before. Um, now you buy these on eBay, there are plenty of people selling these in the box sets and I've actually used up all the good ones so I've had to join two together so that I will be able to um, put this thing together and I've got the screws and nuts and everything already sorted so I'm just going to, um, I generally find that if you put the camera end on first because sometimes they're slotted in the plate so I'll just push the screws through the camera and then just turn this onto here Da -da. And don't do it up too tight at this stage because you may have to wiggle it a bit to get it lined up on the camera plate. Here we go, do it for all these. Doesn't take very long. And you'll see why we have standoffs in a moment. We don't just bolt the camera directly to that plate. Actually, one thing I should mention before we get that far is this little crystal here. Depending on whether you get the Security Camera 2000 or the Surveil Zone camera this may be in a different place but see it's actually sort of just wiggle can wiggle in the breeze here on these little wire leads which are soldered to the board that's not good because eventually trust me I know this is true um, those wire wires will break and the crystal will no longer work and therefore your camera will go black and that's no fun at all so need to pop a little bit of hot glue just to hold that crystal down in fact I'll go and do that now okay there we go it doesn't have to be a whole lot just a little blob will do it just to stop that vibrating and fatiguing the wires so I'll finish putting the screws in here now. When you get a little more advanced, you can actually use slightly different length spaces to angle your camera up in the frame, which is quite important if you want to get start doing some speed stuff. So there we go. There are our basically our things now. So we don't do them up really tight at this stage because we have to line them up now. Make sure we get your plate the right way up because your camera will go a couple of ways. These little fingers here, as you can see on the top here, these 
little tabs and things, they will engage in the plate. So the camera has to be up the right way. And it goes with this big connector here to the bottom. So this is the top, this is the bottom, and this is the bottom of our camera. So we put it on like so. Okay, so the tongues are top and bottom. And these little screws should line up, the little standoff should line up like so. Now we can pop the matching nuts on the back. Now, um, I've used these spaces before, so they're already cut to length, but once you've got your nuts on, you have to cut the actual screw thread portion off flush, otherwise it will bang on the posts on the frame. And as I say, the reason for the standoffs, rather than bolting in the camera straight to the plate, is because, well, for a start, there are components that would get in the way. But the other reason is it puts the camera back from the front of the quad. If you have the camera poking out the front of your mini quad, then when you hit something, you could very well damage or destroy your camera. So by mounting it back, the top and bottom plates of the quad will protect the camera from being completely obliterated by whatever it is you happen to hit. Now, if we bring our frame back into shot here, other end, you can see that now this will fit into here, like so. And you can see from this shot here that the, the frame here is going to protect the camera. The camera will actually be back behind the frame member. So if I put the top frame on as well, it'll make uh, it even more obvious. If I can find the right way around, but when I put this on here, it slots, this slots into there like so, hopefully so. As I say, sometimes these aren't always a perfect fit, but there we go. Now if I hold it on the side, you can see how the frame members, top and bottom, are going to protect that camera, especially considering I've still got the lens cap on, are going to protect it. If you hit a brick wall, it's not going to smack your camera up. And that's why you have these spaces on the side here to move the camera back away from the front. Simple as that. So there you go. Now this all seems fairly nice. We can tighten up those screws and move on to the next stage, which is to unpack our little video transmitter. Now this is the one I've used in the parts list. I mean, you can use bigger transmitter. This is 200 milliwatts. You can go for a 500 milliwatt transmitter or even a 600, but these are really, really small. And to be honest, if you're flying FPV racing, um, 200 milliwatts is all you need. If you've got good antennas, these will give you plenty of range. Um, you won't get far behind trees and things with 200 milliwatts, but uh, you know, that's the trouble with 5.8. It's not, never going to be a great frequency for doing, you know, sort of um, exploratory videos behind trees and going behind ridges and things. It really is for uh, proximity nearby and in lightly wooded areas, you might say, behind the trunks of thin trees. So what do we get? We've got an antenna. This is the, um, the, the cheapy rubber ducky one. We'll use this um, initially because, you know, we're trying to do it on the budget. And these do work. I mean, you know, everyone uses cloverleaf antennas, circularly polarized antennas, because they give a better result. But that doesn't mean these don't work. They do work. It's just that they will, I'll show you, I'll do a comparative uh, video after we've done the build. I'll show you what it looks like through the goggles using these antennas and what it looks like if you use the cloverleaf. So you can judge for yourself whether you go out and buy or build yourself a set of cloverleaves or whether you just make do with what comes in the box if you're on a really tight budget. Now, this comes with a whole lot. There's a, uh, a lead here for the GoPro, which you won't be using, but it does give you a convenient extra connector that goes in the side of this thing here for wiring up. And then it comes with another lead, which is what we're going to be using. It has the little connector on one end and it just has a long length of wire. So this little connector plugs in the side, but you can't plug it in. No, you can't. Why not? <laughs> well, because if you look closely, you'll see if I get the angle right, see this plastic over the over the little hole where the plug goes, see the reflection of the light on the plastic. You've actually got to cut away the plastic around here so you can push the plug in. Um, I guess they're just too cheap to do it in the factory and it would probably cost you another dollar having a little lady there with their sharp little knife or gnawing away at that with their bare teeth just so you can put the plug in. So yeah, don't worry about it. Just get your sharp knife and trim away that plastic so you can put the plug in. Now the next problem, of course, with these things, you see I've cut the plastic away. Next thing with problem with these is this, there's nowhere to mount them. There's no holes. There's no bolting areas. There's nothing. You know, what do you do? How do you mount this damn thing? So this is where you sort of just got to, you know, use your head a bit. And it is covered in heat shrink. So you can actually put sticky on here or Velcro on here and then just splot it on to the frame. But you've got to remember that this is actually where it gets its cooling from. So you can't put too much of insulation around here. And also this heat shrink's not very strong. I've got ones where I've, I've done that. I've actually just sort of put some double-sided tape and stuck it to the frame and then I've had a bit of a crash and it's actually shattered the heat shrink, pulled the heat shrink off so my transmitters come off flooding in the breeze and the heat shrink is left stuck to the frame. So we have to be a little bit innovative and think about how we put this on. And we have to think about not only how we put it on, but where we put it on. And I like to have my transmitters out the back of my 
mini quad. The reason for that is, probably I'll show you in a later video, you'll see why it's actually very handy to have this hanging out the back rather than right up here at the front or anywhere else. So there's two ways you can do it. You can put it on the top like that and I put it upside down, which means you can get at these little switches and change the frequencies very easy because if you're in a racing environment, you may have to change frequencies from time to time to, to get uh, to compete with someone else who's on the same frequency as you. And if this is buried away in the guts and the switch is not accessible, it becomes rather annoying to have to try and change the frequencies by pulling everything apart. So putting it on the top here like this does have its benefits. The other option is to put it underneath so that it's protected from obviously crashing and also gives you a bit more latitude with your battery. If you've got a bigger battery, you can slide it back as and forwards to get the CG right. So what we're gonna do on this one is, I think we'll put it underneath, which does mean that the switches will be, you know, you'll have to actually probably take this plate off to flick the switches, but ah, it's only eight screws, so yeah, who cares? Um, although once we've got our antennas on, it's a bit of a pain with the cable ties, because the antennas, you know, have to be careful pulling it off and on. But because this is gonna be our introductory mini quad, most people are gonna buy this and use it to learn to fly, so they're probably not gonna be flicking switches too often anyway, and we'll see how we get on. Um, but speaking of flicking switches, again, these little dip switches here, they are covered by plastic as well, so you have to cut away around the dip switch so you can actually get at these to change them, otherwise everyone will be flying on band A channel one, which is the default, and that's no good at all because you can only fly one at a time on a given frequency. Now you can see I've taken the plastic off and the switches now can be flicked back and forth with something sharp like a knife or my wit and you need to think carefully about what channels you're going to use what frequencies you're going to use because not all the frequencies are legal in all countries and for example here in new zealand i think we have to use band a if we want to stay legal because that covers the ism frequencies on 5.8 gigahertz that we're allowed but um, if you are using an immersion set of fat sharks with an immersion receiver in it and you want to use these transmitters you have to go to what they call frame four or uh, sorry frame f or band four as it's called um because that has the immersion RC frequencies, the eight immersion channels on there. And so it'll work with your fat shark goggles. If you've got a set of sky zones, well, you can choose anything, but that's say just check the legalities. You don't want to go stomping on someone who's using the band. And just as importantly, you don't want them interfering with your signal as well if you choose the wrong frequency. So there we go. Uh, now, of course, we've got to mount it on this frame. I'm going to just use a little bit of um, self-adhesive tape on, where am I? Got to get into shot. It's a little bit of self-adhesive double-sided tape on there and I'm going to use one of those little, you can use a cable tie, but cable ties are a bit hard on the components on the side, so I'm going to use one of those rubberized sort of elasticated chunky strips that I'm sure someone will mention in the description a good source to buy them. I think you get them on eBay. Uh, so let's hook this baby up onto the, onto the frame here. Now just a tip for young players, you need to make sure that you know which colors what, and it's got it listed on the side of the video transmitter here. And so if you plug the cable in, you can actually write down, for example, in this case, black is ground, white is audio, yellow is video, um, black again is ground, and then the input power is on the red, which can be seven to 24 volts. So you can write that down so you don't suddenly mount this upside down, you can't see it on. Oh, what do these wires do? Oh no, I've forgotten. Anyway, but you'll be able to refer to this video if you use this particular transmitter, which is the TS5823, as it says on the box. But anyway, in case you don't, if you're using a different transmitter, always make sure you know what the wires are, because once you've stuck something, and I've got some of this little thin foam, double-sided sticky foam from Hobby King, and I mentioned before about providing enough um, area for heat. Um, I've used these transmitters, they don't overheat if you do this, this is the way I've mounted them before, so all I've got to do is just cut a piece to size, peel off the backing, and you just slap that on there, like so. Ta-da! Now that's going to provide the camera will focus again, come on, get your act together camera, yeah, that'll provide mounting, it'll provide some vibration isolation, and a little bit of you know give and take, and it'll stick it in place. But we're not going to solely rely on that sticky because that's going to put too much stress on the heat shrink, and chances are that the sticky foam would just rip or the heat shrink would rip off. So uh, we're going to use some of that elasticated crocodile type strippy stuff like this, you know, the stuff I talked about before. We'll use some of this to go around the frame and also hold it in place. So now get your top frame. Remember, we want to put this on the bottom, so we will flip it over. And remember that. Um, We've decided that um, this, this is the Mobius end here, so we want to put the transmitter at the other end, not the end with the Mobius holes, or we'll get really annoyed. We can peel off our little sticky layer here. Hopefully it'll peel off. Come on, here we go. Yeah, yeah, whoops, left a bit behind. Ugh, that's always the way, isn't it? Murphy's Law, there we go. So now I can stick this over, and I'll put the antenna on, because you need to make sure that the, everything's going to clear the vertical spacer holes because there's vertical spaces at the back so we need to make sure everything's going to clear and what I tend to do is move this over 
to the side here. So we've got clearance for our wires and it means the antenna will come out more or less in the middle. So we'll just move this over here and allow enough room for the antenna to poke out. Remember that bends there, that's fine. But also try and move it a bit closer to the back just so that we clear this post here because we may want to use a circularly polarized antenna later, which means we've got to be able to get in here to tighten this up. In fact, I'm just going to put this over here like so. And if you get it wrong, well, you can all rip it off and try it again. I'll just put it here. Yeah, that'll do. That'll do for a start. You can always rip it off and do it again, but let's just get it somewhere to start with. There we go. So it's stuck on. Oh, isn't that lovely? Um, now we can get our little crocodile strip stuff. I don't know what it's called actually. Anyway, this stuff here, we can wrap this around. There's a couple of slots nicely provided in the frame for that to go through and um, pull it through. And the nice thing about this is you can actually move it out of the way so you can still get at these switches underneath. Okay, so there it is. Pretty simple. I'll put the strip around there over the top of that. That's not going anywhere anytime soon. And of course our antenna can poke up at the back like this just to give us our signal and we can replace that with a clover leaf. It is a little bit vulnerable there like that with these antennas, but well, you know, part, there's not a lot else you can do at this stage. And some people mount these further back and run an extension up, but oh, it's just too much farting around. And this does have enough give that it's unlikely you're gonna break your transmitter if you have a bit of a, a crash anyway. It's more like it'll just wobble on the foam and move out of the way. So we'll try it like that anyway and see how we get on. Now we're going to do some wiring. Got to get our soldering iron out again because there's some wiring to be done. Obviously we have to connect the camera to the transmitter and then we have to connect them both to the power, the 12 volts that comes out of our three cell LiPo. So we need the little camera lead and the camera comes with an abundance of little leads in a bag. If you get it from this, the surveil zone one comes with these leads here. I'm not quite sure that the security camera 2000 one is as well endowed with leads and there's a number of ways you can do it. They actually provide you with a pre-made lead that has a connection to a servo type plug but yeah, that's like way long. So I'm going to use the little short lead they provide with just three wires. We've got yellow for the video, black for earth and red for the battery and that plugs in the side here. Um, it's pretty easy to see which way it goes. It'll only go one way so it plugs into the side there and we're going to test this before we actually mount it in our mini quad because we're going to have to do some tuning. There's another plug down here because one of the things that comes in the box I haven't shown you yet is this. It's a little programming board. It's just five little tap switches which enable us to use the on-screen menu in our camera to set up the exposure and, and all the other bits and pieces, wide dynamic range and things that make this camera such a really good little board camera for uh, FPV use. So now we're going to have to make up a little wiring loom to connect up some of these wires together and then put a JST connector. And if you don't have a JST connector, look, you can steal the one off the uh, GoPro one, but it's a pretty thin wire. Yeah, don't like that. I'll use a proper JST pigtail. And at this stage, I'm not gonna put any power filtering in because I'm not sure if we'll need it. So I'm gonna try it without the power filtering. And if we need the power filtering, we're gonna come back and we're gonna um, put the power filtering in, but it'll be a good, good example of what it looks like without power filtering and the effect that power filtering has afterwards if we need it. So let's get our soldering iron heated up and our side cutters out and start joining some wires. Now it might be tempting to, uh, to wire this all up so it's all sitting nicely on the top plate, but um, it's possible if you've got a battery strap here, that could get in the way if it doesn't fit between the batteries there. So I just prefer to have all my wiring sitting on the bottom of the frame where possible. So we're gonna have our frame here and basically our camera is going to be sitting in here. It's getting a bit messy, I know, but just bear with me. Our camera will be sitting in here like so, up this way. Oh, better get it up the right way. There we go. So our camera will sit there. So I want to run these wires basically along the side here and then up probably this pillar to the video transmitter, which is on the top of the board. If I, as I say, if I run them all along the top here, when I put my battery strap around, it's going to be pulling on these wires and I'm not happy with that. That'll, you know, if you have a really bad ding and it could actually rip the wires out of there. So we'll run the wiring so that it's all pretty much down. And I'll put this around on the side so you can hopefully see if it's going to focus like this. So these wires will run along the bottom and the video transmitter wires will come down from the top and we'll use this pillar as the place where they, they meet up and join and we'll put a couple of cable ties on there or just a cable tie on there just to hold it all in place. Um, bearing in mind that um, if you want to take this out you can just unplug this which means it doesn't matter if, it, if these wires are cable tied to the pillar. Okay let's take a look at which wires go where. This is the bit that confuses people sometimes. Um, we really have three things to join up. We've got the wires coming out of our transmitter and as we already noted we've got red and black which are for the input voltage and earth. And then we've got 
black, yellow, and white. The white we're not using. Don't need the white, that's for audio. Don't need any audio, thank you very much. Um, there's no microphone on here, complete waste of time. So we've got yellow and black. The black is another earth. In fact, these two wires are joined together inside the video transmitter, so you're just, they're just doubling up on that. The yellow is the video signal. On our camera, we need, obviously, the red wire is voltage going in to make the camera work. We've got black, which is the earth, and then we've got the yellow, which is the video coming out. So the yellow coming out of the camera has to connect up to the yellow that goes into the video transmitter. Very simple. The black coming out of the camera has to connect up to the black that goes off to the video transmitter. Again, incredibly simple. The only tricky one is here we got the red, because what we have to do is join the red from the camera to the red from the video transmitter and we also have to connect up our JST pigtail red because that's where the voltage is coming into the system so we're going to have 12 volts coming out this red wire goes into there which powers both the video transmitter and the camera so all the reds get joined together the yellow joins to yellow black joins to black white we ignore and then the other black lead on here goes off to the spare black wire that we have from the video transmitter so I'm going to do that now okay so the first solder joint I've made has so basically join the red wire, this one goes off to the camera, this one off to the camera, to the red wire that goes off to the video transmitter here, and the red wire from the JST connector. I'll pull out so you can perhaps see that a bit more clearly. So I've joined all the red wires together. So as I say, just go over it again, the red wire to the camera is joined to the red wire which goes off to the video transmitter, which is joined to the red wire which is on our JST connector. That's simple, so that's the positive supply hooked up. Okay, now what I'm gonna join up is the black wire from the camera to the video transmitter and the yellow wire from the camera to the yellow wire from the video transmitter. So there we go, yellow joined to yellow, black joined to black as I said. Now I've used some very fine heat shrink tubing there. If you don't have fine heat shrink, what you can actually do is just stagger the joins and use a single piece of heat shrink over the both pieces of wire. As long as the joins are staggered far enough apart, they won't short out and you won't have any problems. But I've got some nice fine heat shrink, so that's what I've used. Now there's only one other wire to join up here and that's the black from the video transmitter, the one that runs next to the red wire to the other part of the JST. Once we've joined that up, we're all ready to power up our video system. There you go, so there is all the wiring. If you're in any doubt as to what goes where, I'll just pull in a bit here and you can pause the video at this stage and you can see which wire goes where, which of these wires is connected to which, so that uh, you can reproduce this yourself. Move this out of the way so hopefully you can see which is the correct wire to connect up. And if you just join them like that, you can't really go wrong. It's quite simple. And now it's time to tune up the camera, adjust the various settings to get the best results for FPV. So we plug in that little board that I mentioned before, plug that into the bottom, and you're going to need your um, video glasses or a video LCD screen connected up to a receiver because we're also gonna check and make sure this whole setup works. So just try and untangle the wires. Um, now we can get out our screen and we can start playing with these buttons and I'll show you what to do. Here I am, I've got my LCD screen set up. One of the benefits of having this JST connector on our FPV setup is that we don't have to plug it into our multi-rotor, into our little mini quad to make it work. We only have to plug it into a suitable three cell battery with a JST connector on it. So that's what I'm going to do. But first of all, I'll turn on my screen. Come on, make a noise. And I think I've set it up on band one, channel four. So I'll just, there, band one, channel, hopefully, when I plug things in, it will go. And just make sure that nothing can short out while you're doing this, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. Um, and I'll plug this in and hopefully we will get a black screen, which will show that our camera is on, but I've got the lens cap on at the moment. Whoa, look at that, we must have done something right. Now, I'm not gonna bother taking the lens cap off just yet. I'm going to press the center button and get our OSD up. There we go, and I hope you can read that. So here is our OSD that enables us to set up various options. Um, you can play with these to your heart's content because these options, it'll vary depending on where you are and um, what the conditions are like. But basically, if we go into it, uh, where you see a little arrow like that, that means you can press the middle key and takes you to another menu. So this gives us auto shutter, brightness 40, that'll be okay, AGC. This is the one we want to change, this dynamic wide, or um, wide dynamic range. So we just press the right arrow and bing, it's on. Now I'll show you what that means. I'm gonna take the lens off the camera, lens cap off the camera here so you can see 
I'll point it up at the lights here and be able to see what effect wide dynamic range has. I've done the, I've reviewed this camera before. If you haven't seen the full review, then I'll link to it in the description. But see how we've got a really bright light and that's causing the rest of the room to be quite dim. If I turn on the wide dynamic range, oops, press the right button. Now see how it brought up the background? Turn it off, turn it on. Turn it off, turn it on. You can see how it plucks the rest of, just because you've got a bright item or a bright source in the view, when you turn on the wide dynamic range, it brings up the brilliance of the background without blowing out the bright source. It increases that dynamic range. That's what it's for. And you know, it's um, even when we do it here, you can see that the stuff on my bench there, you can't see very easily the stuff around here, but when I turn on the wide dynamic range, it pops. You can see the color of the bench mat there. You can see all the things. Otherwise they get lost. And this is when you're flying along, you're flying, got the sun facing you. you can, perhaps you can see the sun in the sky and you've got trees below. Without wide dynamic range, on the cheap, cheap cameras, um, some of the cheap CMOS ones, really crappy ones, you get a really poor picture because they don't have that, the wide dynamic range that just pops up all the stuff that's otherwise just in the darkness. Really important that you turn on the dynamic wide, right, wide dynamic range. So let's go down here, let's go back to the next thing, got backlight off, don't worry about that. Automatic white balance, I just leave that as it is. Day and night, leave that as it is. Special, don't worry about that. Then image adjust, this is the next important one. When we go in here, we've got a lot of things we can play with is two dimensional noise reduction. Ah, I don't bother too much about that. Doesn't make a hell of a lot of difference unless you've got really snowy conditions. Um, you can see there's a bit of noise on the signal now. It's not making any difference. So leave it on, won't hurt. Mirror, you don't need to worry about that. That's only for security camera purposes. Uh, font color, ignore that. Now contrast, and this is an important one. If you have too much contrast, then you lose the detail because all the blacks get too black and it just gets posterized. I tend to turn this down a bit, um, maybe to you know 128. Then sharpness, you can wind that all the way up because you want as sharp a picture as possible. This is another important one. This chooses the type of display. Now, if you press enter on there, you can go in and change things, set them up. I'll go back um, to there. I'm going to, I'll just show you what it does if you go LCD. Now notice that brought up the brilliance just a little bit with LCD and there's another one, user. So we're going to user because we can tweak these a bit more now. For example, gamma, oh, uh, ped level, that's the level of the black areas. The, it's the pedestal level, I call it. That's how black the blacks are. Um, color gain, or first of all, I'll go up to gamma because gamma is the important one. I missed that, I'm sorry about that. Gamma changes the image. I'll change it and you can see what happens. Whoops, I went too far. Notice we go, as we go down, the whole picture seems to get a bit lighter because it moves the curve, the contrast curves, as it called, down. So um, a low gamma is quite good um, when you've got an overcast day and as you move it up the blacks get blacker and, the, and it's sort of it's like turning the brilliance down a bit so yeah you want to play with this one a lot I'd run mine quite low I'd probably run at 30 and uh, but as I say your mileage may differ now color a uh, red ped level we've already covered that color gain if you like the colors to pop and look really exciting and vivid greens then wind it up if you like a more realistic image with perhaps the more muted colors that look like they'd look with a normal eye you can wind it down uh, i'll just leave it where it is for the time being there we go so that's on user display we've customized this the rest we can ignore um, what have we got dpc that's dead pixel don't worry about that unless you've got a bright spot or a black spot on your screen um, language if you ever get really stuffed up and you don't know what you've done you can always reset to the stock values, the out of the box values, and then try again. But there we go, that's gonna be good enough for us to do some basic work. Now, remember, these settings will interact with the settings on your goggles. If you have the brilliance too high on here, then you can tone it down a bit on your goggles. If you have too much contrast, the same, or not enough contrast, you can tweak it up a bit. So you need to have sort of a reference. Um, get it looking really good, and then if you've got more than one camera, set all your cameras to the same settings so you don't have to keep adjusting your goggles. But those settings I've given you there, yeah, they'll work close enough to get started, and they're better than the stock settings in most cases. Once we've done that, of course, now we can power this down and start sticking it on the actual quad itself. So unplug that board, stick it somewhere safe. You're gonna use it again. You may find you get out in the field and the colors are a bit different. You wanna have a play around. You can take it to the field with you and adjust it uh, while you're actually out there having a fly. And I'll unplug, of course, the whole thing. So right, so now we've got our board. We can stick it on our on our quad. Let me get this in the right place. Um, our oops, got this wrong around the, around the wrong way. It's no good at all. Now, at this stage, you'll notice there's no power filtering. I haven't used any power filtering on this build because I'm gonna try it out without the power filtering. That's gonna do one of two things. If there's no noise, saves me a snot load of time building a power filter we don't need. If there is noise, I'll be able to show you what the noise looks like and then we'll have a look at how we address it and fix it. Um, but it's no use fixing a problem until we know we've got one. So now this 
camera goes and get it up the right way. As I say, this big wide plug goes to the bottom. That's on both the Security Camera 2000 version and the Secure Zone version. So that fits into the slot below. Now our put our antennas up here through this space at the back there. We're going to put cable ties on those in a moment because this is going to be, we shouldn't have to take the top off again. Um, this will go down here. Slide this slot into there. We can get it in. There we go. Now we can put our screws on. We've got our antennas through. We've got our camera in place. All this wire hanging out the side here, we're going to tidy it up in a minute. But uh, let's put some screws on first. Don't have to put them all in. Let's just put a couple of screws in just to hold things in place temporarily. And so just make sure you've got everything in the slots there. Otherwise, the thing won't tighten down properly. And off we go. Come on, get in the hole. There we go. Put another screw at the back, diagonally opposite, just to hold that in place. Alrighty, -o. I'll just, just nip these down, won't do them up really tight because we're just checking things out for a start. There we go. So, I'll put my antenna up, turn it around until it's in the up position. There we go. So, now, as you can see, um, what I have to do is start cable tying these wires. In fact, I should have I've left a bit of a gap so I can actually slide this one inside that, that stand there, that pillar, because I want to bring this down along the floor of the mini quad. Bring this one around here, and I actually want to bring these ones inside. <laughs> See, that's why I said don't tighten them up. I'm going to have to take the top off again because I've got them going around either side of that pillar. Oh. Please stand by. So there we go. Hopefully you can see what I've done here now. I've got the camera wire runs down here. I've cable tied it to this post here, run it along the bottom, cable tied it to that post there, and then it goes up, obviously off to the camera. The JST connector from the wiring loom we just made plugs into the JST that we previously soldered into the power supply system on the bottom of our mini quad through that little copper board. There you go, it's all connected. Next thing, we're gonna put our Mobius platform on because it's much easier to do it when the top frame, before, or before you screw down the top frame. To do that we take our four little grommets and we push them through the holes. Actually sometimes it's really easy and sometimes it's really hard. It just depends on the actual kit. This one isn't too bad by the look of it. Um, don't be tempted to use screwdrivers because you'll end up making holes in the grommets and then they'll fall apart and that'll ruin your day. So I shall just try and get that in the hole. If I had a dollar for every time I'd said that with grommets like this, um, you can pull them through from the back side. You can also use a piece of wire to, and I'll show you one of the benefits of the setup we've got at the moment. I don't want to wreck anything, so I just unplug my video transmitter and put my frame to one side. Now I can work on this without causing any damage to anything. Put my aerial down, it's not going anywhere. So yeah, I just pull that grommet through. You can see that's now nicely on the side there. Do the same with the other three. Right, so um, now we've got the bungs in the bottom. I'm going to show you a little trick. Remember that wire we had hanging out? We cut some off. Uh, well, it's always a use for everything, as I say. Never throw anything away. I always repurpose stuff. We're going to put our Mobius platform on here. And one way to get these little bungs through is to slide the piece of wire through the hole, like this. Get it through the hole. This wire is a little bit short. I should have made it longer. But anyway, then you hook it around the top of the bung there. You line it up and you just give it a damn good pull. And if you wiggle and pull at the same time, you'll find that it'll pull that grommet through. Yeah, I should have made the wire longer. Never mind. Uh, it'll pull the wire through and you'll end up with uh, of course make me a liar won't you there we go it's actually a bit of fiddling and farting around and I shall oops, cross them over here we go pull it through and what did I tell you here we go they're all nicely in place now what I recommend you do is um, put a cable tie through just one of these a cable tie right around because then when you have a smack it's going to resist the temptation to come off these actually are quite tight these particular ones on this. The grommet's actually quite small, quite tight. I don't know that they'd come out nearly as easy as some of the other frames I've worked on with the ZMR. So there you go, that's nice. You want to put some Velcro on here so you can stick your Mobius on Velcro on the body of your Mobius. But there you go, basically that's done. So now, now finally, finally after all that farting around, we can put our frame onto, well, a top plate onto our frame and we're nearly ready to go FPV and it's getting pretty exciting now. I hope the weather is okay outside. I've been in here all day, haven't had a chance to go and have a look. So here we go now. Let's uh, get our camera in place and maybe it's time to finally do those bolts up. Of course you have to move the Mobius platform to the side to get the bolt in once you've put it on and uh, only thing really left to do is to 
put our cable ties in for those antennas because we want to make sure those antennas are going to be um, out of the prop. Very important to have the antennas out of the prop, otherwise you end up with much shorter antennas than you're supposed to have and a significant reduction in range, funnily enough. I don't know how that works, but um, I won't bore you. I have to plug this in the side, of course, again, because I unplugged it to do the to do the, uh, the Mobius platform. So we'll move this around here, plug it in the side. You can't see any of this, I suppose, because I'm way out of shot, most likely. But, um, yeah, and I've got big booty hands. Anyway, plug the transmitter in the side, you know what I mean and put the rest of the screws in. Now it's time for our cable tie antenna mounts. Now, I don't have actually probably, are they gonna fit? Oh yeah, they'll fit, okay. So we need to put some cable ties through the groove, or well, there's a, uh, a slot here on the top of the frame. As you can see, just move the antenna out of the way. And whoop, actually these are a little bit big. I didn't have any smaller ones at hand, but we'll see if they're gonna work anyway. The idea is to put your cable ties through here like so, there we go. This is not the best, but it will do. And uh, as I say, you should usually have smaller cable ties than these. Um, I've only got big ones. Oh no, I've run out of small cable ties. Um, and then we obviously need to trim them. Don't trim the end off your antenna when you do this, please. Just, you know, make sure that you're cutting a bit above the top of the antenna, like so. Oops, those aren't very good side cutters. There we go. And then we wanna put some heat shrink over here to hold that in place, find some heat shrink the right, the appropriate size, which I will now reach down. And of course, it's very important that you color coordinate this. If you don't, then your wife will complain at you and you'll be in such big strife that your life won't be worth living. I think that's going to be the right size heat shrink for this by looking at it. Or is it? Or is it? Yes, it is. So cut out a suitable length of that, a little bit longer than the, than the cable tie itself because you want to have a bit of spare on the end. Put your antenna against the cable tie. Try and hold it in place while you push the cable, push the heat shrink over. And if you do it right, you don't even have to shrink the heat shrink because it's gonna be just the right size to sneak over the whole lot. And that saves you a bit of farting around. It also means that if you have to take it out later, you don't have to put new heat shrink on because if your heat shrink is the right size, this is getting a bit dodgy, it may not slide. It might be just a little bit too tight to slide all the way down here but I shall persist, you never know your luck. Anyway, it doesn't have to go all the way down. Um, I'm gonna put it down to there and I'll just trim this off here. This is not the neatest one I've done, but it gives you the idea. And again, as you can see here, um, that's keeping the antenna up because we want, as always, we want our antennas at 90 degrees to, the, to each other to give us maximum diversity. So here we go. Now say, so if you use smaller cable ties, this will be much easier than using the big booty ones that I've used here because I've used up all my cable ties on other things. Ah, and if you wanna make sure you get in the same length, then take the piece you cut off the other cable tie, which I've gone and lost, and use that as a marker for cutting the other one. How did, how did I lose that? Oh, it's on the floor. Hang on a minute. Bends down, picks it up. Okay. Yeah, use the piece you cut off as a template for cutting the other one, like so then you'll have them roughly the same length. It won't look all out of place. And another piece of heat shrink should do the trick. This is the right size, is it? Yes. And I'll make the heat shrink roughly the same size too. So it all tries to try and match it all up so it looks lovely and pretty. Then we have put this up here. Slide our heat shrink over as before. Well, this seems a bit bigger. This, oh, this heat shrink's bigger. I've used the wrong size. Never mind. Um, I'll put a, bit of, put a bit of hot on that turn it into a bit bodgy, but she'll be great. I'm in a hurry and everyone wants to get this finished. So we'll just try and make it. So I'm shrinking this one, but I'm not shrinking the other one because the other one was tighter because I used a better size heat shrink to start with. Oh, who is this guy? He should have done better prep. Never mind. I've had lots of emails saying, when's the next part coming out? So here it is now. You're watching it at this very moment. There we go. So there we go, we've got our antennas on and they're at roughly 90 degrees. You can bend them, shape them to suit roughly 90 degrees. But if you land upside down, they're just gonna bend out of the way and you know they're not gonna get stuck in the props, not gonna get sucked into the propellers, which is important because if they get sucked into propellers, well, you know, ka-ching, there goes your things. Now, mention about these antennas, these ones that you get in the box. 
they are a pain in the backside sometimes because they do tend to fall over a bit like that and if they fall over like that then they get minced up or the props get mashed up by the antenna so one thing you need to do if you're going to use these antennas is put a little bit of tape on the back just to stop them rotating once you get them tightened up in the right place then you need to put a little bit of preferably removable tape like masking tape or cellar tape or something just put a bit of tape because they have a swivelly base thing and if you put the tape around there like so then they won't tip over they won't fall over and trash your props okay i reckon we're actually done i reckon this is ready to fpv there you go look at that isn't that a beautiful looking machine that's just lovely that's gorgeous that is so we need to find out whether it's going to make a lot of noise when we power it up uh, whether we have to put some power filtering in we can do that pretty easily we'll just basically do a quick hop and uh, i'll record it on the video screen so you can see what i would see through the goggles and then we'll decide whether we're going to take it out and fly so here we go here's the magic moment will we need any power filtering on this thing so i will arm it and i'll hold it in my hand and i'll give it a bit of a rev and we'll see whether we get all sorts of lines no no lines to speak of that's brilliant that means we don't need power filtering with this particular setup if you've built it the way i built this one then power filtering will not be required so there we go that's the build there it is you've seen it fly fpv mini quad flies you know quite well um as i say the zmr 250 is not my favorite quad but for the money it's really hard to beat and this setup we've tried to make it as cheap as we can saving pennies without trying to sacrifice too much quality did have an issue with the dys motors um but everything else seems to have gone together reasonably well and yeah um what I'll be doing now, as I said, is you've seen the footage recorded on the DVR using these uh, horrible sleeve dipole antennas. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to change over and put some circularly polarized antennas on here. And then I'm going to go and do a comparison video. I won't do it today because it's getting late and I know you wanted to see this part of the video. Um, so that'll be a follow up. Um, basically, how are we going to improve on this little mini quad? Because this tuning the PIDs as well, that'll make a difference if you want to get, you know, let it all hang out and go real wild. And... Uh, yeah, so stay tuned. There will be another part. If you've got questions, comments, anything relating to this video, then please put them under the description of the video. And in the follow-up video, I'll try and answer all the questions that have been posed. And if people have come up with good ideas, you know, hey, I'm happy to share them with, you know, the rest of you, because I don't know everything. Um, and it's, you know, really amazing the number of really good ideas that you pick up from other people, like these antennas. That was a, a viewer's idea, and it worked brilliantly. It's widely used now. So there you go. Thanks for watching. It's time for me to get... Back to the bench. Bye for now.